Monica, I think we have at least our regular uh, seminar attendance. So um, I think we'll start now. Uh, it is a true pleasure to welcome David McKenzie uh, from the World Bank to open our webinar series. Um, he'll be telling us today about this paper on improving business practices and the boundary of the entrepreneur, a randomized experiment comparing training, consulting, insourcing and outsourcing. So some work uh, that has been recently done in Nigeria, as far as I understand. So the floor is, is yours, David. So please. Fantastic, and thanks Thanks very much. So I, I should say this is joint work with Stephen Anderson, who's now at uh, UT Austin. And uh, it, I apologize, the paper is, is almost out, but is not quite um, out yet. So it's uh, still very new and, and comments are very welcome. Um, great, so the, the, the sort of background context here is that uh, we know that there is, things that we'd like firms to be doing in terms of better business practices that seem to be good for them. So uh, Chris Whitter and I measured across a whole range of different countries, the extent to which firms are doing things like keeping records, uh, doing some basic marketing practices, like asking customers, you know, what, which other products they would like to have, ch you know, chasing up former customers to see why they stopped shopping with you, uh, doing um, some pl long-term planning, uh, some budgeting, some, and sort of inventory management. And if you look across a whole range of different countries, it seems like firms that use more of these practices are more profitable, are selling more in the cross section. And then if we follow them over time, these, these types of firms uh, grow faster and are more likely to survive. So it seems like these practices are good, but then when it comes to trying to uh, get firms to adopt these practices, it seems uh, like it's quite hard. And so the sort of traditional way that we've gone about that is to do business training programs. And so uh, when Chris Woodruff and I looked at a review of, uh, I think about uh, 12 or 13 randomized trials of, of business training programs, we found this typical one, tried to teach a whole range of different business practices and got firms to adopt, you know, maybe uh, one out of 20 practices that they tried to teach. And so, you know, the result was that, you, you know, these, this training did something, but the typical training programs are relatively short. It doesn't get firms to change practices that much. And then as a result, it was really hard to detect whether firm profits and sales were, were changing. And so uh, in this context of this project that I'm about to tell you about, when we heard that you know, the idea was to offer business training again, we thought, is there a bus better way of trying to build business schools, skills and in, in growing firms? And so, the idea, which we'll go into in, in more details, is that when you start, when you're a one-person firm, the entrepreneur is the firm. But as the firm grows, you know, we often talk about the boundary of the firm. You know, where do you do things within the firm versus without the firm? But there's also this boundary of the entrepreneur. What types of things do you need the entrepreneur to do for him or herself? And what types of things can they get somebody else to do? And so this is what we're going to be looking at is uh, sort of making decisions about whether you need to do these business practices through the entrepreneur or whether you can think about alternatives where you get somebody else to, to do these practices for the firm and whether that may be more um, successful in, in getting the firm to do these business skills than trying to train the owner to do everything him or herself. And so just as is sort of descriptive, uh, we're working in the context of this government project in Nigeria, and there was a whole range of sort of different um, programs that the government was offering. And so this is from the application form where we had uh, about 8,000 firms applying um, for, for a very different variance of this program. And so um, here, if you look at the firm size and at the proportion of firms who are keeping the accounts themselves or doing the marketing themselves, you see when firms, is, uh, sort of very small, of course, the owner's doing everything. But very quickly, as the firm starts growing, the entrepreneur doesn't do everything for him or herself. They start getting somebody else to do it. And that could be often somebody inside the firm, but sometimes, sometimes somebody outside the firm as well. And so we see that for both marketing and for um, accounting. And so if we're trying to think about firms that we want to grow, and we're taking a firm that has, you know, five workers or, um, three workers and we think they're growth oriented and we think we want to get them up to 10 or 20 workers, then the question is, should we try and teach the entrepreneur to do everything him or herself? If, you know, we, when we look at many firms with 10 or 20 workers, 
they, that's not what is going on. And so maybe we can sort of accelerate this transition and accelerate this process of getting them to get somebody else to, to do these skills for them. So what are we going to do? We're gonna test three market-based approaches to building business skills in firms of two to 15 workers in Nigeria. So this is in the context of a government and World Bank project that we'll go into some details on. And so we're gonna test one-on-one uh, -on -one consulting where the government allocates providers, but these providers come in and do sort of consulting in these firms. And then these two newer interventions, which are insourcing, where firms are gonna be given a subsidy to use a human resources firm and that human resources firm will then um, help them hire a worker who can join the firm and do the accounting or marketing for them or outsourcing where the firms are getting a subsidy to choose a professional marketing or accounting firm that is providing the service for them but is not part of the firm. And so then we're gonna compare this to a group that gets the standard business training into a pure control group and track impacts on business practices, on firm performance, et cetera, over the next two years. And so, you know, this, these are some headline results and we'll go obviously into a lot more detail. But what we find is that business training here was not very successful. It had only a very small and statistically insignificant impact on business practices and no significant impact on firm growth over a couple of years. And so uh, business training, I should say, is the thing that governments and uh, a lot of NGOs and things love to do because it's very easy to sort of show that you're um, helping firms, it's very easy to put on. You just grab a whole bunch of firms and put them in a classroom and train them. Um, and so sort of, it, it, um, so it, it is, you know, we, we, in a new review paper, I've sort of found that maybe four to 5 million firms get business training each year um, around the world, about a billion dollars is spent on, on business training. So this is sort of the status quo um, for these types of firm support programs. So in contrast to this sort of status quo, all these three alternatives result in, um, in improvements in different business practices. These persist over time, they last beyond um, when the interventions end. And then these new things, the insourcing and outsourcing result in more innovation. And then uh, we, we see at least for the outsourcing, uh, higher profits and sales. And we can't reject that the impacts are the same for insourcing, but we also can't reject that they're zero. So they're in that annoying uh, range there. Um, the insourcing and outsourcing do at least as well as consulting at half the cost. And so it's not, so the consulting is also useful, but it's just more costly um, than the insourcing and outsourcing. Okay, so this is uh, what we're going to talk about today. I'll go through the context of this project, the application process, uh, and, you know, what types of firms we're dealing with, and then we'll go into details of these four interventions, look at their impacts on first business practices, then on firm performance, and then different mechanisms through which uh, these practices are translating into better firm performance. And then, you know, ultimately, you know, whenever we do one of these things and we find something that works, we have to ask ourselves, why, why weren't firms doing this themselves? Particularly this was sort of, we're encouraging firms to use the market. Why aren't more firms using the market already? So um, we'll provide a little bit of uh, an answer to that and then conclude. So um, let me just take a quick, uh, check and make sure there's no questions or clarifications before I jump into it, but I'm sure, you know, a lot of the things will become clearer as we go through. We good? Okay. So the context here is a project called the GEM project. And so uh, GEM here stands for growth and employment. Uh, and this was a, a big project uh, that where there was a large loan behind it from the World Bank to the government of Nigeria. And so like a lot of these projects, there would be sort of uh, a component that was trying to improve the investment climate for all firms, and then a second component that's really trying to directly help um, particular firms in selected industries. And so this uh, project was focused on five industries that the government had selected for growth potential, and they're quite heterogeneous industries. So we've got light manufacturing, we've got hospitality and tourism, we've got IT, we've got entertainment. So think of this as like, uh, movie producers making Nollywood videos uh, or, or um, content like that, um, as well as some, some sort of music content. Uh, and then we've got the construction industry as, as well, but that's also gonna have sort of architecture and things. And so, you know, when we're talking about business practices or talking about ways of helping these firms, we've got such a heterogeneous mix of firms, we wanna, you know, something that's gonna work across a range of industries. And we also, you know, wanna think about different business practices that make as much sense in uh, 
you know, entertainment as they do in light manufacturing. Okay, so the application process here was that there was a, um, you know, widespread marketing communication campaign using radio, TV spots, social media, some roadshows and things. And then firms had to apply online. So we already saw one acronym, we saw GEM. Um, so you, to get into GEM, you had to go on the big platform. So big here was business innovation and growth. And so, you know, this was the ad. Um, and then you come onto this platform and you have to uh, apply and, uh, you know, give some basic information about your firm. And so then after an initial application, there was a first screening. So just to make sure, is it really in one of those five industries? Did they give you the complete information? Is it an SME um, here in Nigeria defined as one to 99 workers? Is the owner uh, not a child? And just some sort of basic information like that. And then, you know, again, this was for a sort of a range of different um, packages, including some sort of grant windows and some uh, equity windows and then various types of business development windows. And so firms were to, then invited to come to this induction workshop. And so there, you know, they would, ha they would get more information about the program and these different windows, the different types of things they could um, apply for depending on, you know, their, their size and sophistication and things. And then at that induction workshop, they were given a baseline survey, which was administered um, here. So this, this photo here shows, you know, everybody getting their little baseline surveys one-on-one. -on -one which is collecting um, information on firm and business practices. And so firms here were told at baseline, you know, this is a diagnostic, it's gonna help us make sure we can, you know, get the right types of services that are gonna best help your firm. And so um, we're getting that, that baseline, you know, conducted at that time. And so then based on that, that uh, application, firms were scored on the proportion of different business practices they were already doing. And so if firms were really um, not doing anything whatsoever, uh, then they, and they were just sort of completely, um, you know, unsophisticated, they were not going to get any support at all. And so hardly any kind of felt who'd, who'd gone through the effort of applying and, and getting to, to that stage um, are getting there. And then if firms got sort of between four and five out of 10 of the practices, um, they would get some basic online um, business training, but, but not be sort of eligible for, for much else. And then most firms, so 73% of firms ended up in this range of sort of five to eight points um, where they're getting gym support on building their business skills. And then they were told, you go through this program and you can earn points and then there will be a chance of getting a grant at the end. And so, um, so this is sort of an incentive for firms to participate in these skill building programs. But over the period that I look at, um, in this, this over the sort of two years, nobody's got grants. And so um, you can think about, uh, you know, there being a grant in the, in the future, potentially with some, some probability for these firms, but uh, um, everything that, that we look at is gonna be an impact of the, the programs themselves and not the, the grants. But, um, and, and then I should say there was just, you know, one to 2% of firms who were already really excellent and, or at least claimed to be really excellent in terms of their business practices. Um, and then they were fast tracked to either advanced consulting or um, to, to some windows for grants and equity. And then finally, on top of that, to be in our experiment, we, we restricted it. Remember they that you could be from one to 99 workers to apply for this program. Here, we wanted to focus based on those graphs that I showed you on firms between two and 15 workers. So we said, if you're gonna start sort of getting um, a, one of these these people into your firm for the first time, this is a, the range at which it seems like it might be reasonable. Um, if you've already got 50 workers, you're probably um, already outsourcing or insourcing or your accounting and marketing. And then we were just focused on two of the cities in, in uh, Lagos and Abuja, the um, largest city in the capital city, uh, since we could find vibrant business service marketplaces there. And then we wanted to make sure you weren't already insourcing or outsourcing both your marketing and finance. So this is uh, then going to give us a sample of 753 firms for our experimental sample. We, um, I should say we had initially targeted 2000 firms and there was meant to be sort of multiple batches of these firms coming through the program. Um, but then the, the program ran into some difficulties and other elements of it. And so they halted um, recruitment of, of others. And so we ended up with less than half the sample we had 
hopeful, which is going to affect our power a bit for looking at some of these business outcomes. But, uh, it, you know, we, we've still got a reasonable size sample here, 753 firms. And these firms have a mean of um, four employees, a median of three. Uh, most of them are sort of between two and eight employees. 44% uh, are run by women. Um, most of them are formally registered. And the, the owners have quite a lot of education. So 48% actually have post-graduate um, education. They're 38 years old on average. Um, and then they've been running the firm for about four years and they've got about $3,000 a month in sales. So, you know, we, we're, th we're looking here at firms that, was, that sort of had applied for a program to grow their firms, had gone through, had at least turned up and gone through this induction workshop, had, you know, have some reasonable level of baseline business practices, and uh, um, then are going to be, uh, you, you know, not run by um, super young people who, who haven't got any experience, but they've got some sort of education and some experience. And then um, in terms of this mixture of, of industries here, half of them are in light manufacturing, and then the remainder are sort of equally distributed across the range of firms. So just to kind of fix in your mind what types of firms we're talking about here, you know, we've got somebody here who, um, you know, tailors and makes um, um, shirts and, and sells those shirts. We've got sort of an IT business that's doing data recovery and hardware and security systems. We've got, you know, somebody who's doing some um, types of uh, clean energy consulting things. We've got somebody who's in the construction sector that's sort of doing roofing and windows and things like that. We've got somebody making, um, you know, these, these DVDs and things of movies. And then we've got somebody who's uh, um, r raising and smoking catfish and doing processed um, fish. And so direct agriculture couldn't be there, but, you know, if you were processing the um, products and making them into things, then you could could be there. So you can see quite a heterogeneous mix of firms, which also makes it harder to detect impacts, but, but also means that the results we get are not sort of very specific to one industry, but are coming across a range of different industries. All right. So then the experiment here, we, we set up, uh, we, we're randomly assigning firms at the individual level into these different treatments. We had these different induction workshops. And so each time we got a batch of firms from one of these induction workshops, then we would randomize firms that had gone through that into the different groups. And so we had eight different um, induction batches. And so each of those eight become one strata. And within those strata, we randomized firms. Um, it was equal proportions to these different groups. So we're gonna have uh, approximately 150 firms in each of our different treatment groups here. And again, we'd originally hoped for 400 in each of these, but we, we ended up with 150. So 150 are gonna get insourcing, 150 outsourcing, 150 business training, consulting, and then a control. Okay, so um, we'll go into details of those interventions, but just to give you the timeline of, of you know, when all this happened. Um, so we've got these applications and inductions um, were, were taking place in 2016. The interventions took place in 2017. Um, so the training was, was, was pretty short, so you could get through that pretty quickly. The consulting and the outsourcing um, and insourcing lasted longer, but they're all sort of finished um, by the start of 2018. And then we have a first follow-up just after the interventions have, have uh, finished, and then a second follow-up over um, a year later, and um, sort of two years after they'd started things and at least a year after everything had ended. We have reasonably high response rates and they're, they're pretty balanced by treatment status here. Sorry, David, uh, so yep. these follow-up surveys, how are they done? Uh, so they are, they are in-person follow-up surveys um, in, in both cases with then phone follow-ups used to track down, um, you know, a, f a few of the people that we, we couldn't get with multiple attempts, but they were done on the business premises. And I'll talk a bit about some of the things we measured, but one of the things in particular was trying to um, get really detailed and objective measures of the business practices. And so that's why we wanted to be there in person. Mm -hmm. And who was the person at the firm that was responding to the service? Uh, the entrepreneur or the owner. So, okay. um, and then, then we'll also have some data collected if they have, we, we did, do some interviews of the workers who, who joined if they used um, these to sort of understand a bit of what they were doing in the firm, but these uh, main outcomes are gonna come consistently mm -hmm. across from, from the owners. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Um, sure. David, uh, hi. So uh, 
I wanted to to ask you about the what, what a bit more detail about the incentive structure of these people that are helping. So so these uh, the the people that are uh, being hired for. Uh, yeah. So let me let me go into that in a minute because uh, when I go through the interventions, which I'm going to go in detail, okay. you will see you will see how they're getting paid and things, and then let's revisit that question once uh, I've explained okay. um, each of the those. Um, so maybe I'll go into the interventions and then th th then I'm sure you'll have a lot all have a lot of questions on on those. Okay, so let me go into the details of these these interventions. And so the business training here um, was was a relatively uh, fr from the point of view of business training was a relatively expensive and intensive business training. And so it cost around US two thousand dollars per firm. And so this was in part why we were motivated to think about some of these alternatives when we heard okay this business training is going to be two thousand dollars per firm we thought wow that's you know from what we know about business training um you know we reckon we could potentially do something else with that money that might be more beneficial so this business training was based on the ifc's main um, product at the time which was called business edge uh, it was a sort of pretty standard types of training program with modules in financial management marketing general operations and human resources and then firms could also um, choose from amongst uh, modules on personal productivity, enterprise government, and tourism and hospitality. So the way it worked was that there was, um, first there was online training. They had to sort of choose five online classes, um, each of five hours each um, and complete those. And then there was uh, 12 days of in-class training. And so, as I mentioned, there was, firms would get points um, for this that would get them to be eligible later on for potential grants and things. And so this was their in the incentive of firms to sort of show up but well, as well as learning things was to try and um, get these points, which were for both participation and for um, performance on sort of tests and things in these classes. And so um, the firms, um, you know, so typical day of training, you would go through and you would learn, you know, this, this, this day here is on financial management, you know, what is a budget, the benefits of budgets, let's, you know, go through budgeting, um, go through using budgets and things. And so you're in a classroom type setting, you know, there it's, it's adult based learning. So there are, um, you know, interactive exercises and things, but this is sort of a very traditional type of business training. It was developed by, uh, it was, implemented by this enterprise development center, which is sort of one of the most experienced providers in um, Nigeria. It's, it's, it's associated with the Pan-Atlantic University there. And the, the take up of training was, was uh, reasonably high here. So 93% of firms started the online training, 75% completed at least uh, their five online classes, and then 61% completed all 12 days of in-class training. Okay, so this is the, the training and I'll talk about who the trainers were in a little bit more detail um, in a minute where I compare them to the, the others. But this, this I think is sort of the more, most standard intervention um, for you, um, you know, that people are probably most familiar with. David, one, one quick question. Um, yeah. What, what's the state of the literature and maybe even your own work on uh, kind of benchmarking this to cash? Like, do we know what the effect of a $2,000 grant to small businesses is? Yeah, so, so, um, you know, we, we would have loved to uh, have done uh, a cash, cash arm and they would only give cash conditional on, you know, firms going through these, these things. And so then we had hoped that we would measure, the, you know, the additional effect of cash and sort of used to do that. But then the project ran into difficulties and we, we, we couldn't see that. So $2,000. So I have, you know, experiments with $100 cash and experiments with $50,000 cash. Um, you know, we don't have so many experiments with, with, 2000 cash. Um, I have a recent s sort of review paper that looks at the, you know, what we know across a, a range of studies on uh, the returns to business training. And I, there I benchmark it on, you know, what, how, how it compares to the return to sort of standard education, the return to capital. Um, you know, there, I, it, it sort of seems relatively competitive, I would say, surprising. It surprised me when I did those calculations that uh, uh, you know, they, they, they sort of, and you'll see when we go through, um, again, with, you, you know, typically with a grant or a loan, if we think, you know, there's the, an interest rate of like 20% or something on a loan, um, or if you think about a cash grant, if, you know, firms are getting returns of sort of 5% per month or something, they, they kind of can get 
back the return on that in about two years or something. And so that type of window is what we're seeing from training that sort of successful training programs in sort of one to two years firms seem to earn back the cost, cost of the training. Um, but um, again, that sort of depends obviously on how sophisticated the firm is and their size to start with. So if you've got a firm that's, you know, only earning a small amount of money and you get, then it's very hard for them to re recap this, you know, $2,000. But if you've got a firm that's earning, you know, $2,000 a month and they get a, um, you know, 5% um, increase in profits from that, then, you know, then they're going to be getting, you know, a hundred bucks a month more profits and then they can get that 2000 back, you know, relatively soon. And so again, it's, you know, this is, so, you know, the short answer is we don't have great cash benchmarking, but it's not completely crazy to think that it could be competitive. Although we thought it was crazy to think that $2,000 in training in this type of training would, would, be better than just giving them cash or doing something else with it, which is why we proposed something else at least. Okay, so let me go into these other interventions. Um, so, that, so then the second thing, which was also something that the project had originally proposed was business consulting. Um, and so this business consulting here uh, is 11 days of business consulting, sort of 88 hours um, spread over six to nine months where the consultant comes in and meets with you at least once a month. And there they're giving you very tailored services. And so um, they have an initial visit where they go through and work out a growth strategy with you and a sort of assessment of where you need um, work. And then they've got this, they've got consultants they are gonna help focus on sort of these four areas on management, finance, um, sales and marketing, operations in, in HR. Um, but exactly what you do is going to be very firm dependent. And so, um, so, so again, most firms went through this and they've, you know, it's not just the consultant coming in and, and sort of giving you advice, but they're also giving you tasks and activities to do between um, visits. And so, you know, one example here, they came through and, and then, uh, you know, they did the finance and budgeting class, but then she's got this assignment where she has to put together the budget, compare it to, um, last year's records and then, you know, really organize the records and then the consultant's going to come through and check. Or another one, you know, the, the marketing consultant tells you, okay, let's learn about what your customers are, are, are liking and not liking. Let's get feedback and learn about how to segment them. And then, you know, what, but before I come back again, go and survey 20 of your clients and get, um, you, you know, answers to the, to this. And then we can use that to help plan your strategy. And so this is, um, you know, a bit different from uh, training where you're sort of doing some exercises, but they're sort of um, less tailored to your business and, and they're sort of right there in the classroom and you're not getting, you know, these very individualized fine tune assignments. And so this is, you know, more intensive than, than training. It's, it's twice as expensive as training and it's spread over a larger amount of time. And so this is something that we, we sort of have some evidence for from a couple of other studies that this type of individual consulting uh, can be successful for, um, firms, but tends to be quite expensive. And so, you know, this is the, um, and it, um, here I should say the government is choosing the consultants. So the, uh, when a firm is in this program, they don't have any choice over who their consultant is. The government says, okay, you're in this program, this consultant has been assigned to work with you. And then, um, you know, the government is paying the consultant directly. And then the firm is just sort of getting that consultant come along. So then these two, two new interventions are the ones that we helped set up. And so the first one was, was insourcing. And we said, okay, let's take that $2,000 that you're going to use um, for training and let's um, use that instead for the, uh, setting up this insourcing. And so um, here, firms in this group are getting um, given access to an online marketplace. And so here we went through these markets in, in Abuja and Lagos and, and sort of identified human resource um, providers and vetted them. And then we set up a marketplace um, where there's a list of them and, and the firm, these HR specialists get to sort of give a little blurb, a little Twitter statement about um, them. And then firms are told, okay, you need to go onto this marketplace, find three that you like the sound of, um, talk to them and, and then choose one. And then they're going to help you recruit an accounting or marketing worker. And these HR specialists typically charge sort of one month's worth of the worker's uh, wage um, for this, this service. But then, you know, this, the firm is going to get the subsidy from the government, but then the firm is making the transaction directly with the HR specialist. And so we're trying to get them to, you know, 
this is a contract between you and the HR specialist and then a contract between you and the worker. And then that worker um, had to be a full-time worker. They were meant to spend at least five days per week at the um, firm doing things. And then that firm was gonna get a subsidy that would pay sort of fully basically for the cost of this worker in the first few months, but then gradually decline over nine months so that by the end, the firm was used to covering almost the entire wage. And so the idea for this is it wouldn't be so stark when the subsidy ended and that the firm might get used to sort of picking up more and more of this worker's cost as that worker showed sort of more and more value for the firm. And so here, you know, this is much more market oriented because the firm is in charge of choosing which HR provider from this list. And then the HR provider is providing a list of candidates. The firm can sort of choose which candidate that they want from this list that the HR provider um, does. And then this worker uh, and joins the firm. And the firm also gets to choose whether they would like this worker to be a marketing or accounting worker. And so most of them chose marketing workers here. Okay, so that's insourcing. And, um, so here's an example. So this was a firm that was doing architecture. Um, and so they hired this uh, young woman here, jo Janet Marcus. And so um, she had sort of re um, recently graduated. She'd studied sort of digital marketing and things. And then so she helps them put together, you know, nice glossy um, presentations and uh, sort of helps their digital side and helps them sort of um, get, get these things and prepare things for, for shows and things like that. And so she's, she's coming in and helping them do their marketing. So then let me talk about um, outsourcing, then we can kind of have any questions about the sort of whole bundle of them. So then on outsourcing, it was sort of a similar approach to the insourcing, except the marketplace here, rather than being HR providers, was specialist accounting firms or specialist marketing firms. And so then here you're gonna outsource a function of your business to that professional. And then you're saying, okay, I'm gonna hire um, this marketing company. They're gonna send this professional who's working for me and working for other companies and they're gonna come at least one day a week to my site and, and do things. And so um, the subsidy here, that was sort of about how much we figured that would, would cover. And again, it was a declining subsidy where you're paying, um, it's sort of covering the full cost for this professional in the first few months, but gradually declining. But again, while the government is paying the firm, the firm itself is doing all the contracting with these professionals, is the one responsible for paying these professionals and sort of is getting used to them, them directly doing, you know, a payment to these professional firms. Um, and again, most of these decided to choose marketing companies. And so 95% of them hired a company and 85% used it for the first, the full nine months. So here's you know, an example here. This is a, a business um, that was making plantain chips. Um, and so, uh, Aeronaut Global Ventures and so this is the owner and she hires uh, an accountant who comes in and helps them sort of set up cash flow statements and, and uh, um, other records like that. So there's quite a difference here in terms of the intensity and the experience you get from these different um, types of programs. And so, um, you know, just to look at the age for, for, so let's just compare insourcing and training, which to start with, which are sort of at the opposite ends of the spectrum. So sort of training, you tend to get providers who are very experienced, 49 on, on average with 15 years of experience. Almost all of them have got postgraduate education and um, formal skills certification. But then they're there in the classroom with you and a whole bunch of other firms. Um, these trainers uh, are typically getting paid about a million Naira a month. That's about $3,000 a month. Um, and so, you know, they're high human capital um, people, but sort of tr delivering, you know, think of them as, as much more like professors delivering, um, you know, training to groups of, of, or, or groups of students. And then at the other end, we have insourcing where they're much younger. They've sort of, uh, you, you know, got much less work experience. Uh, fewer of them have got formal school certifications, but then they come and they're working in your firm, you know, five days a week, 40 hours a week. So you're getting, you know, 1400 hours rather than 84 hours of time. And then these workers are getting paid um, around 50,000 uh, Naira a month, which is about $140 a month. Um, and so they're joining your firm um, like that. And then you can see outsourcing, they tend to be um, older, more male, um, more skilled, um, but they spend less time in your firm than the, the um, ones who are um, the, the insourcing. And then they're getting paid more than um, 
twice as much on average. The, the mean here is about uh, $500 a month rather than $140 a month that they're getting paid. And then the consultants are getting paid sort of similar rates to the, the outsourcing people and are, have got more skills though on average. So let me stop and see if there's, there's questions there, but you can see sort of there's quite this, this, this sort of distinction between the types of people you'll get with these different experiments. Uh, David, I think you said it before, but I, uh, just to confirm, so what you're saying here in terms of the pay that um, each of these different uh, interventions is getting paid per month is not the cost for the firm, right? So in terms of, I mean, uh, how much of these, what fraction of this cost is being paid by the firm with the subsidies that are being provided? Right, and so the way we did this, um, so, so um, was that they, these firms would get, um, a declining subsidy. And so yeah. the subsidy was actually 70,000 in the first months, and then it declined to 10,000 at the end. And so you can see here that the pay of the, the insourcing mm -hmm. worker, this is, the, this is how much the firm would be paying them. They'd be paying them 50,000 a month. So at first, actually the firm was even getting slightly more than it was costing yeah. them to hire the worker. And then by the end of the, so the last couple of months, they were um, getting, you know, the, they were, the subsidy was only covering sort of 10 or 20% of the cost of the worker. And so the idea was then, you know, by the time oh, the I, nine months ended, the firm was used to paying for most of it. No, I this understood here dynamics. Is, I was, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so I should say for, for the outsourcing, this is how much the, uh, the outsourced worker was earning. So the firm was still paying about 50,000, but then this worker would be working for other firms as well, which is why they're sort of earning their pay and their pay is coming, you know, from their company. Um, and so, you know, that 50,000 the firm would pay would cover both, you know, some cost to the, uh, the outsourced worker, but also some profit to the uh, marketing company or accounting. Yeah, I understand. I, uh, what I was trying to get at was um, what was the cost for the firm of each of these different options? You explained it, the schedule as it is dynamic. You did not get yeah. like, on average, what fraction of the cost is being paid by the firm for each of these different options? Right. So for, you know, for training and consulting, the firm is paying nothing. Um, so, so the training, they go to training, you know, it's just the opportunity cost of your time to attend training. So, uh, and similarly consulting, the consultants are coming and you don't pay anything. The government is paying everything else. For these, um, you know, for the insourcing and outsourcing, then the, the firm um, is, uh, yeah, I, they're, they're not paying changes over time, anything yeah. at first. They're paying a bit at the, the end. Um, and so, um, you know, maybe they're paying, uh, you know, 20% or something in total over those nine months. I'd have to figure out exactly how it all mm -hmm. works. Thank works you. Out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, I, I had, another, yeah. I had question. another question. Yeah, please. So uh, I'm wondering, while training is kind of, uh, I mean, it's fixed in content, it looks like that the other treatment are not really fixed uh, in content. So I'm wondering whether you, you can give us an idea of what is the heterogeneity of um, the way that the firms use this type of, um, because some, some I saw that it's about accounting, but it's not only accounting. So I'm wondering, what is your take on uh, the fact that it's very diverse what the firms are using in terms of activity? Right. And so, so um, I think that's, you know, the, the training tries to teach a whole range of different practices, right? So it sort of says, okay, we think every firm should know how to do every one of these uh, um, things. And so it's got modules on, on all these things. The, the insourcing and, and outsourcing um, tend to be sort of more sp sort of concentrated on particular areas, right? So you hire somebody for marketing and then they're going to you know, help you really on marketing practices, but you're not going to get so much out of them um, on accounting or human resources or things. So that's a first thing. Then within that, um, you know, they're going to see where you're, this is the other advantage. They're going to be more tailored to what your firm ne needs and to what you're already doing. And so if you're already doing, you know, if you're already good at one aspect of marketing, they're not going to spend all their time reinforcing that. Whereas training is, you know, one size fits all and it's going to try and, you know, teach everybody the same content. And so we're going to look at which practices change. And uh, when I, when I look at the results, we're going to see, you know, what actually happened um, more. And I'll tell you more in, um, about what specific things they did, but obviously, you, you know, that is the difference that training is, is very much your, you've got, you know, 20 people in a room and you've got to try and, 
you, you know, teach the same thing to everyone, whereas with these others, you, know, um, you can really tailor it more to, to the needs of particular firms. Pedro? Yes, so uh, I was wondering about, um, well, I guess you, you're, you're, you're still going to talk about measurement, but some of these, uh, some of these uh, interventions are, are better at tailoring, you know, you know, these people are not, not only doing stuff, but they are also selling their work to a certain extent. So, so I, 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 was, I was wondering about uh, whether there could be effects on, on measurement just from the fact that these people are getting inside the firm uh, for insourcing or, or, or outsourcing, but not for training. Uh, and, and that relates to a potential heterogeneity, probably you will not be able to, to compare because that's, that's a decision of people, but, but those that, uh, that wanted to go for, for the finance guys and, and those that wanted to go for the marketing people, uh, that is probably an interesting comparison. Um, and then I was wondering also about uh, the motivation. So, so, um, so certainly these insourcing people are, are I, I'm guessing, are probably very, very highly motivated because they, they that's the incentive structure that they have. I mean, their, their future depends on, on, on whether this works or not. Uh, while the other people are, you know, they, they don't depend as much on, on, this, on this specific role they are taking with this firm. So, right. so well, yeah, although I think, my, you know, yeah, the, with thoughts. the outsourcing, we, we, we definitely, you know, it's the same thing as, you know, we, we tried to make clear, look, you, you know, we, we hope that this will be a line of business for your, your firms and um, you know that the firm should be motivated to do this. Um, there's there's also potential sort of broader motivations for these firms that if they are doing well as providers and and you know then you know they think that there's going to be future rounds of this program, then they can think you know we need to work hard for the government um, here as as well as for the the firm. So there could be that bit in the background, but I, I agree that the, you know, the in-source workers, you know, they, their entire income comes from this one company. So you might think, you know, our prior might have been that the insourcing would be the most effective because, you know, they're joining the firm, they're in there all the time and their, you know, their incentives should be the most aligned with the firm. And then these others have sort of more principal agent um, issues pot potentially or, um, you know, have, are less reliant on that firm. But, you know, we will see what happens empirically. Um, in terms of your question about, um, you know, who chooses what and things, I, um, so we, we do look a bit at, you know, what types of firms choose marketing versus accounting. And then when we look at business practices, we will, we do see that the firms that choose the accountants improve their accounting practices more and the ones that choose the, um, you know, management, pra the marketing improved marketing more. And of course that could be because they were planning on improving those more anyway. It's, you know, it was a choice, but at least it's sort of consistent with the people doing the right things. It, um, you, you know, we tried to look at some of the things that determine the boundary of the firm in terms of trust and verifiability and existing levels of things to see what predicts, um, you know, w which one you choose out of marketing and accounting. It seemed like women were less, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly, it seemed women were slightly more likely to choose the accounting and, you know, there was a little bit of difference by industry, but the things that we thought might matter in terms of how much you trust others and um, some of those things didn't, didn't come through um, so much. But again, our sample is, is sort of less than we would, uh, would have liked to be able to look at some of those comparisons. So let me get into t telling you some of the impact. Oh, Claudia, you've so, got one. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I had two questions. So the first one was whether you you um, you check if if some of the companies that took the training, whether they they hired people. Um, so for instance, by attending this training, they could recognize their needs for um, for accounting and and would hire someone that could do this budgeting for for them, and. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't, um, uh, maybe you, you said this before, but, but in, in the training lag, did the businesses have the choice as well to pick the subjects or, uh, or was this, this uh, standardized for, for everyone? So the, it was mostly standardized. There was core subjects in financial management, marketing and things, they, this, but then they had a little bit of like one optional module that they could choose where they could choose a HR one or a productivity one or 
um, a tourism management one if they were more on the hospitality thing. But for the most part, it was standardized. On, on terms of your first question, um, we're going to talk a little bit about, about that on why more firms don't use the market for business services. But the, the short answer is that um, when people went through um, the training, they did not then go on and hire people in the market. But we do actually see that when people... Um, you know, when we help people access the market for the first time with these other interventions, they go back to the market and buy more of it. And so, um, you know, the, the training is sort of a substitute for the market and they don't really learn anything about how to use the market, whereas these other interventions are getting them to, to sort of think, hey, there are people that could help me um, more. Okay. okay, so let me talk about um, these impacts. Okay, so, uh, you know, the first thing we want to do with these interventions is really improve business practices. And so, you know, that's where we put a lot of effort in our surveys and into measuring these business practices. And so we measure 41 business practices over four areas, finance and accounting, marketing, digital marketing, um, operations and HR. Um, and then we selected uh, 10 practices in particular from this list that we felt like we could objectively verify through photographic evidence. And then we have a range of digital marketing practices that we can also objectively verify by looking um, you know, at, at, the, at seeing the output of the, the digital marketing. And so, you know, if, if our concern is that, well, firms are just going to go through training and then tell, the, tell us, of course, you know, we're, you know, you trained us to do this and now we're doing this. We really wanted to sort of avoid that type of experimented demand effect by, by trying to physically verify as much of this and having very detailed questions on this. And so, um, you know, so while we were doing the in-person surveys, we, you know, they said, okay, we've got, you know, we're keeping accounts or we have a HR thing or we have a staff chart or, or something. And so then we're saying, okay, can you show it to us? And then we would have the interviewer, you know, take a photograph of it and, and things. And so then we can physically verify, okay, yeah, um, they're not just telling us that, but they can pull it up and we can see that that is going on. Okay, so what do we um, see? So we measure these impacts at one years and, and two years. Um, I'm just going to show you the, the um, two year, the, the effects, which are the ones that are lasting um, sort of more than a year after everything's ended. Um, but the one year effects are pretty similar in, in both magnitude and um, significance. And so, um, you know, what we see um, here, first, let's look at the training. Um, nothing is significant and these point estimates are, um, you know, zero to, to the third um, digit on most of these things. Our overall index, this is the um, proportion of um, these 41 practices that you're doing. The control group is doing 45% of these 41 practices and then there's no change in that uh, for the, the treatment group uh, whatsoever that's getting training. Um, when we look at the verified practices, those 10 that we were um, taking the um, photos of, um, they're only doing 17% of, uh, of those ones. Um, and there's, you know, positive treatment effect, but it's, it's, it's small and not significant. And so this is sort of in line with the, you know, five percentage point increase in practices that we see from other training. We can't sort of rule out an effect of that size, but it's, um, you know, it's not, it's, that would be at the high end of our confidence level here. So the training here was really not very successful at improving business practices. Then when we look at across these um, sort of other three, you can see, you know, insourcing, outsourcing, and consulting are all, all sort of significantly improving these business practices um, by sort of similar amounts um, here, both for our overall index and for our verified practices. Um, so, you know, we see larger impacts there for the verified practices, but we see some difference in where they're getting improvements. And so we see, you know, more of an improvement in the digital marketing and, and marketing space for the um, insourcing and outsourcing, which mostly choose that. And then things are sort of more distributed across a range of practices for the consulting, more, more of a change in the finance and accounting um, from the consulting going on than, than these ones. But again, we, you know, we can't, you know, reject that the 6% is the same as the, the 9% there. And then we, um, you know, but, but particularly it's really these, these uh, practices um, from the, the marketing that are coming through from the um, insourcing and outsourcing. If we look, you know, within those, those broader indices at things, which things have changed the most, the insourcing and outsourcing are really having big changes on some of the digital stuff. So 
um, the likelihood that they have a website is going up, you know, 13 to 17 percentage points, business Facebook page, 20 um, percentage points, customer relationship management system, um, business Instagram and Twitter. And so, you know, they they're, they're really seem to be focusing a lot on the digital marketing. And these are things that are sort of newer technologies that perhaps, you know, the owners who have gone through and, um, you know, have, have not necessarily learned how to do themselves um, and uh, are less likely to do. And it's not something that sort of traditional training necessarily emphasizes as much um, either. So, um, you know, we're seeing these, these, uh, these practices changing. If, if we're sort of trying to change practices, we're getting more from um, these insourcing and outsourcing than we are from training. Then when it comes to firm performance, um, so, so here, these are the um, two-year uh, effects, I think, again. Um, yes, these are the two-year effects, again, but we, again, we can't reject the one and two-year effects are pretty much the same. Um, so this is where, um, again, if we look at the, the training and we look at our overall index, we're getting sort of a positive but, but insignificant impact here, and our you know, point estimates are definitely um, smaller than we're getting for, for any of the other ones. Um, the outsourcing, we're getting significant impacts across sort of a, a range of monthly and yearly um, sales numbers. Um, our overall index is a 0.23 standard deviation increase in, in this. And we're also seeing, you know, some suggestion that em employment um, increased for the outsourcing um, here. I should say, you know, because these firms are so heterogeneous and we ended up with a smaller sample than we have, it, it's, you know, this is a little bit sensitive to the tails and what's going on with, with, with tails here. Um, we're using this inverse hyperbolic sign transformation. If we use levels, you know, we're getting positive effects, but they're not statistically um, significant. This, this IHS is what we'd pre-specified in a um, pre-analysis plan here. And then um, the insourcing, you know, this is where we're getting sort of estimates that are um, smaller than we, we see from the outsourcing. None of them are statistically significant, but we also can't reject that, that they're the same. And so we're sort of in this in-between zone with the insourcing where, um, you know, it seems to be, uh, you know, giving us um, something that where we, where, you know, we saw similar improvements in the business practices, but then we don't see when, we, when it gets to firm outcomes, the, the same significant improvement in, in firm outcomes. And then the consulting is sort of, um, looking in between the insourcing and outsourcing where it's, it's uh, again, it's not um, significant, but it's, it's almost as, as large in, in, in size on the overall index. We're getting some significant impacts on some of the individual ones, um, but, but remember it costs twice as much. And so, you know, consulting seems to be helping, but it's, it's not helping any more than the outsourcing did um, for twice the price. Okay, so then you know, I'm going to look at some mechanisms. Sorry, can, can I ask you yeah. a question? Sure. Uh, sorry. So uh, is it possible that the, the impact on performance, in particular profits or sales, is driven by the fact they have a better knowledge of finance and accounting other than the, the, inter the training itself? Well, so this is, again, where, um, you know, particularly for the insourcing and outsourcing, most of them are improving the marketing practices and not doing that much improvement. You know, they're not hiring accountants. They're not doing that much improvement in the finance and accounting practices. So that's, you know, one thing. The second thing, um, you know, this is always tricky trying to collect these records from firms, but, you know, we, we have um, tried to collect the, these measures several ways and we sort of see it, um, these improvements across sort of a range of different, um, you know, measures here. And then thirdly, if we, if we were to control directly for those marketing and accounting practice scores. And so if you think, okay, the mechanism is that they're improving marketing and accounting, and then that's mechanically, you know, they were under, they somehow were underestimating their sales and profits before, then even if we sort of partial out the impact on the, the marketing and accounting, the, this, the accounting scores, we would still see these impacts um, there. And so we think, you know, this is really, uh, you know, we're going to look at mechanisms, but we, you know, while it's hard, we don't think this is just a mechanical thing of these people come in and help you keep better accounts. Okay. Because I'm, the concern is because you don't see an effect in employment, which is uh, more objectively measured. It doesn't depend on accounting standards or, or knowledge. 
Well, so, so this is, again, I think is a more of a power issue. We are seeing, you know, you are seeing impacts on, on the, um, you know, the inverse hyperbolic sign of, of employment for, for both of these two interventions. Um, here, you know, the, these estimates are positive, but, you know, they only have six workers. You know, the, this is sort of showing a, um, you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.4 inc worker increase. We can't sort of rule out that they, you know, increased workers by sort of one and a half workers. Um, we just don't have power on, on, on that outcome. Um, so it's also the case that we would expect sales and profits to increase before employment, be, um, to, to, uh, bef before much employment increase because, you know, you, you need to start growing to be able to support more workers. So, um, you know, but this is an important thing on employment because, you know, we were hoping, okay, you know, these firms would keep these workers employed, uh, especially in the insourcing, you know, so that maybe they'll, they'll be larger because they'll at least have that one worker. Um, you know, we asked directly whether that worker is still there. We'll come back, we'll come back to that. Um, but, you know, about 40% of firms still have that worker employed when we ask them directly. But, you know, we can't then sort of rule out that that, you know, there's a 0.4 worker increase, but we can't sort of rule out that it's zero either. We just lack power on employment. And so, um, yeah. Okay, so... Um, let me let me talk more on these mechanisms, and then we can kind of come back to the you know when we have it all to together. Unless uh, um, um, someone else had a, a dying question on this. Okay, so so we had sort of th um, th three um, main mechanisms that we wanted to to look at, where we thought, okay, if you've got this person coming in and helping you. How, how might that help your, your business um, grow? And so the first one was through uh, owner time use. And so, you know, if you hire somebody to come in, um, does that free up the time of the, uh, the owner? And so there was sort of two key questions here was, you know, how much work does the owner do? Do they actually just work less? So we sort of, is the impact on owner leisure um, that the owner does fewer hours of business or does it change what type of work do they do? Do they concentrate time on fewer functional areas and spend more time on growth and external areas? Can you sort of do more strategic things rather than, you know, having to do all this day-to-day -day things? And so, you know, measuring this time use was quite tricky. Um, you know, we asked them, we didn't have them keep time diaries. And so that may have been a better way of doing it. We asked them to sort of split a hundred hours into an amount of time spent over the last two weeks into different activities. Um, and then we asked them sort of directly for, you know, how much of their time they were spending on sort of more growth oriented tasks and things. And so we see in that sort of first year when the interventions there, you know, some slight improvements in terms of time spent on marketing and sales that if anything, hiring these people who work on marketing and sales um, means that the owner also spends a little bit more time on complementary tasks um, in the short term. And then there's no long term effects um, there in terms of the amount of time that they work, the owner doesn't change how much time they work in their business. And so, you know, the, the firm is getting more time input, but it's not really changing what the owner does in a way that we, we could measure. But we acknowledge that, you know, maybe time diaries or something may have been a better way of doing that. The second thing is, is uh, sort of, are they innovating more or investing um, more? Does, does sort of having these, um, these people come in, help them think about new ideas and think about new products and things like that. And so we see, um, you know, we have a range of different measures of innovation, but this is mostly coming in through new product um, introduction. And so having these, these insourcing and outsourcing workers come in means that you sort of start with, um, you, you know, more branding and, and, and with more products, you're talking to customers to see what else those customers might like you to be selling and you start introducing new products um, into your firm. And so we see that coming from the insourcing and outsourcing, uh, you know, nothing coming from the training there. We don't see over this sort of two year horizon, the, the firm's doing a lot more investment. They're not sort of heavily investing in capital or things as complements to this additional labor. And then, um, you know, we think this digital marketing seems to be something that's really showing up and, and there might be sort of several reasons why we think this could be particularly um, well suited for going beyond this boundary of the entrepreneur. You know, so we think there's, you know, it's not likely to be um, a core competency of, of most firms. It doesn't require a lot of firm specific knowledge. 
and it's something you know one of the things that comes through in in you know whether you do things yourself or whether you do things to get others others to do things is you know how verifiable the task is and how specific uh, it is and so this is something where you can verify the outputs relatively easily so you can see whether you've got a website you can see whether you've um you you know they're they're doing marketing and then you can start seeing sort of some immediate things from that where customers come and say i saw you your facebook advert or i saw this new um you, you know your your special offer today on um uh, on instagram and i'd like to purchase that and so it's something where uh you, you know potentially the owner is going to be able to uh see immediate um rewards from those efforts and and sort of also be able to verify that the worker is doing things there. It's also an area where things are changing dramatically and the owners may not have learned this. And so the quality of what they could do themselves may be worse than what specialized workers could do. And so, you know, we wanted to look and say, okay, are they doing more of this, but also is the quality better? And so, you know, this is the nice thing with, with them doing this digital marketing is we can, they give us then their, their digital marketing and we can look through and we can see what they're, you know, posting on Instagram, what they're putting up on Facebook, uh, you know, what they're doing on Twitter, uh, et cetera. And so we can um, have people go through and score the quality of the digital marketing in these firms. And so we have, the quality of their website and their digital media scored on 50 dimensions with uh, by coders who are blinded to treatment status. And we have, you know, a first reviewer and a second reviewer um, score this. And you can see, you know, they're very highly correlated here. Um, and so this quality measure of, you know, are you doing higher quality, um, not just quantity of digital marketing um, is, is, is very highly um, correlated across these two reviewers. And then when we look at impacts on that, we see uh, definitely higher quality um, digital marketing coming through from insourcing and outsourcing. And so they're helping you, you know, do more of that and that's going to help you get more customers. Yeah. So then, you know, the question is why firms are not doing more of this already. Um, you know, this program is improving business practices. These service, these providers are out there in the market. So this, you know, got to the, the question Claudia had before of, you know, why don't they just go and, you know, even they learn that they need help in these, these areas, why don't they go and, you know, why is this program needed to help them? And so, you know, we asked firms directly, uh, you know, how important various things are for themselves and for other firms, they think, you know, not um, using these. And, and so, you know, we have sort of two main sets of frictions that come through. One is informational frictions where, about um, half the firms say we just don't know you know who exists there in the market it's really hard to tell who's good and who's not good um, if you want to hire them and so you, you know we just really don't know how you would go about doing that and who you know who would be a good um, provider and so that's you know one thing and then the second thing is just a cost benefit consideration where firms say you know i'm not sure if it would really be worth the cost of doing it i can't afford um, it it um or it's you know it's just too risky for me to to try because i'm just not sure what the return would be and so you know it seems to be about um 50 50 and so you know we wanted to think about how much our intervention is helping overcome both of these types of constraints and in and you know what are we doing with this intervention obviously we're giving a subsidy that helps deal with the cost benefit considerations but we're also providing them sort of this this market platform where we're doing some screening of providers and things and so we did a survey of providers and compare our providers to others in the market to see you know how they differ um, and so we find that the providers that we had vetted tend to be slightly bigger and more skilled than the average provider in the market with a little bit more um, spare capacity not sort of huge differences but we definitely are sort of helping um, find the ones who are, you know, a little bit more uh, established without being the massive um, firms in the market. And we're providing that information to, to firms. And then we're also, I think, subsidizing those, the initial cost and allowing firms to learn by doing so they can sort of see what the value is directly through experience um, rather than just, um, you, you know, knowing that there's those firms out there, but without knowing whether it's beneficial or not. So, you know, when we try and look at whether it's worth it for these firms, um, it's, you know, if we try and just do that cost benefit calculation, this gets a, uh, the, the question Wayne had before on sort of, you know, how would it compare to a return to capital? 
Um, it's a little bit tricky because of this heterogeneity of firms and you know uncertainty in some of these profits and sales measures, but the gain for the outsourcing firms is about $100 a month in, in profits. Um, the direct subsidies that they got were $1,300 in subsidies. Um, so the, uh, you know, the full cost of the intervention was 2000 if you think about sort of the vetting and the setting up of it and the running of it and checks and things. And so, um, you know, this outsourcing um, gain of $100 per month in profits and, uh, versus $200, um, $2,000 in cost, the outsourcing sort of pays for itself within, um, you know, just over a year and a half to, to within two years. And so it seems like it's, it's worth it from that point of view. If you take any sort of reasonable cost of capital, if you can make a return on your investment in two years, that seems like it on average, but of course there's uncertainty around that. So that's sort of one measure. I think a second measure is just a real preference measure. If we, we look um, the firms that have got these services are more likely to have gone back to the market to buy more of these services. And so they're more likely to have um, used an HR provider or a consultant um, in the second year after, you know, all the government has, has stopped this. And so, you know, the insourcing workers report keeping between 37 and 48% of the workers that they'd hired and the outsourcing firms are still using the provider, um, that same provider sort of 30 to 36% of the cases as well. So this sort of revealed preference suggests at least for, for many of these firms, they, they seem to think that it's worth spending their own money on using these services. And so the fact that, you know, they weren't using this um, market in the first place is, um, you know, partly just this, this sort of information um, th um, friction, but the information friction may not be overcome by just the, the sort of knowledge of these providers, but it's, you really need to sort of learn through this experience we think of of um, you know, this initial subsidy. So I'm just gonna give my last concluding slide and then I'm sure we can have a discussion of you, you know, your, um, these results more. And so you know, this was something where there was this idea of, of trying to help these businesses get be better business practices through training. And we said, you know, maybe with that same amount of money, we could do better through some alternatives. And we proposed these two market-based approaches of insourcing and outsourcing. And they were definitely more successful at building business practices in these firms than trying to train the owner. And so, you know, we think, uh, you know, this seems promising. We think there's these two roles then for, for government potentially. So one is, you know, making these, these markets work better, help reduce some of these information frictions, help, you know, these providers compete better in the market and develop, you know, reputation and quality. So the, the information frictions fall. And then, you know, secondly, if you are trying to directly help firms and, um, and you're trying to target these growth oriented firms, then this could be a useful alternative to try than, than uh, um, just paying for, for training. So let me, you know, stop there and we can have some discussion. Maybe it's super clear and everybody's gone home. I can't <laughs> it was very clear indeed. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, yeah, what, what I found really interesting here is this idea of the learning by doing, which for me, I mean, makes a, a total sense in terms of these interventions helping. I mean, the kind of information friction I'm thinking about is people yeah, lacking the information that they get when they try it subsidized. So, I mean, the whole design that you have reducing the cost over time, I think that's all very... Um, how can I say, telling in that direction. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess to be better sure of the mechanism, you would have to run the experiment again and try different incentive schedules, right? So that, that's the only thing that I was now thinking. Otherwise, yes, I think it's a really, really uh, great tech. Uh, and, and so I should mention that, you know, we, we did, um, we weren't able to run it with different incentive schedules, but one thing that we did do was just say, is it a pure information friction in terms of them not knowing um, yeah. what the quality of these, you know, who these providers are and the quality of it. And so we have sort of a subsequent work where we, once we'd gone through and, you know, we had these firms all rate the quality of the providers that had worked with them. And then we also had mystery shoppers go in um, and, and uh, you know, visit these providers. And so then yeah. we set up this marketplace and we just said, okay, is it enough if you, t if you, you know, set up something like a Yelp, um, you know, rating service for these providers and you just tell firms about the existence of these providers and the quality of them um, with these sort of star ratings and things. And so, um, you know, we're still analyzing that, but it sort of seems like, you know, that helps shift them away from 
choosing the really lousy ones, but it doesn't really get them to uh, that, that, uh, that information alone is not enough. It seems sort of this, you know, this, this initial kick um, start with the subsidy or learning by doing uh, learning by experience is, is needed. And it's not just enough to tell you, okay, there is these consultants out there and other people think they're good. Um, that didn't seem to be enough. Thank you. That's yeah, really interesting. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, okay. Can I have a follow-up? Oh, sorry. Yes. Mattia had. Go ahead. Thank you. Pedro, you want to go? No, no, no. Go ahead. So I had a question about uh, the distribution of screening costs uh, for firms on the market when we compare insourcing versus outsourcing. So if I have to go and look uh, in the market for a young, uh, recently graduated um, worker against a firm with maybe a consolidated image in the market. And in this sense, I was wondering which kind of contracts do these firms have to sign when they start the insourcing and the outsourcing agreement? Uh, what, what's the commitment on both sides? and whether you see a significant difference in the expected cost to, to substitute uh, either the in-source worker or the outsource company in case uh, they want to, to switch to another one. Right, so, so with the insourcing, you first have a contract with the human resources firm. Um, and so you, pay, you say, I'm gonna pay you, you know, you've helped me find a worker, this is, and so then all that screening of sort of identifying the marketing or accounting worker is done by this professional firm who has sort of a list of graduates and does the sort of background checks and things on that. And then they're provide, you know, they're providing some sort of guarantee that if the worker leaves within um, a, you know, short amount of time, or if they're not a good fit, they'll help you find another worker. But, you know, that normally lasts for just a couple of months or, or something. Um, so that was something that happened occasionally was that if the, one, after a few months, the in-source worker quit, then um, you, know, you would have to go back and go through this whole process again if you wanted to find another worker. Whereas if you're working with a, a professional firm and that worker quit, then they would just find somebody else from the firm who could help you. And so you know, it, in that sense, there's a little, you, you know, it's a, you're a little less bound to one worker if you work with a firm than with that. But the contract, you know, you're, 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 you're you know, we're letting the market work. So you're right, you know, these, these HR providers have traditional contracts that they would do where you're paying a fee for their services and then they're providing, you know, the screening service and a guarantee of some sort. And similarly, you know, when you're contracting with these, um, you know, workers, then you're, you know, you're deciding what type of contract to work with those workers, um, for, you know, for, but you've got sort of more freedom on that side. You could replace them, you know, with a different worker if you're not happy with them. With the outsourcing company, you know, you're contracting with them. And again, you know, you're, you could replace them and go, go with a different firm if you wanted. So during, you know, our subsidy was not tied to any one provider, but um, yeah. Great, Th thanks. And just uh, another question if I can. So do you see any complementarity uh, of potential complementarity between the profile of the in-source worker and the company. So if I am a uh, young, res recently graduated, or at least I have uh, on average uh, two, three years of experience, I might need a mentor, which I might find in an outsourced company, but I might or not might find within uh, the company an in-source in. So do you explore this channel? Yeah, that's not something that we've looked at in, in detail so far. I think in part because of the, you know, you know, trying to look at that match quality with the sample sizes we have may be a little um, tricky and we don't, you know, we don't have a lot of detail on the outcomes for these, uh, the insource workers and we're not able to track them when they leave um, the firm. And so, you know, ideally to look at that question, you'd want to say, okay, this person came in and then, you know, they, they, they weren't a good match and they left, you know, what, what happens. So we only know sort of, you know, about the ones who are there at the time, but we don't know what happens when they, they leave. So I think Claudia or Pedro had a question. One of, one of you were. Do you want to go first, Pedro? Claudia, go ahead. Yeah. So many sort of a follow-up uh, question on what Miguel was saying. So 
Might it be the case that, that different treatments um, have an impact on different outcomes? So you mostly look at growth, right? But it might be that, for instance, if, if, if we're talking about a, uh, an intervention in, in financial practices, that you would see um, an effect on efficiency, right? So, so um, and, and then not necessarily you would sell more, but for instance, your, your resources or something like a, um, um, uh, a measure of, 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 re of uh, uh, um, um, sorry, the, the, the asset turnover, for instance, would, you, would see, you would see an impact on asset turnover, but not necessarily an impact on growth, and not necessarily an impact on profits, at least in the short run, right? So you could have, it could be the case that you, that you would see an impact, a short-term impact on efficiency and not necessarily profitability, not necessarily growth, at least in the short run. Yeah, so my, my co-author Stephen Anderson has um, a paper in South Africa that has one of the most successful training papers. And there, you know, they, some people got their marketing and training and some people got accounting training and in both cases profits improved and they improved from the accounting by them reducing costs and they improved from the marketing by them increasing sales. Um, so, you know, we would think if, if the accounting was helping you sort of really understand your cost structure and get better at, at that, then over two years, you know, partly this is also a return on investment question, right? It, it, it could be the true case that, you know, these things, eventually lead to improvements sort of five years down the line. But if you're having to pay the cost now and you don't see any change in profits for at least two years, it becomes very hard for most firms to sort of make those types of investments. So we, you, you know, we think that's one thing. On terms of, you know, the other thing is just the heterogeneity of these firms. I think if you were just working with manufacturing firms and you can look at sort of operational productivity and things, but if you're trying to compare, um, you know, for a movie making um, firm and, uh, uh, you know, firm that's doing um, sort of consulting and another firm that's doing manufacturing, trying to compare some of those things across firms is very difficult. So, yeah. Petra? Yes. So, uh, just a small question on, on, on following uh, up with these people um, that state, uh, that state helping the, 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 the different firms. So do you have a sense of whether, um, because I'm, I'm trying to distinguish the, the task from the motivation of these people. So do you have a sense of whether these people uh, stay on doing, doing the same things or maybe they, they, they are, maybe the firms found out that these are, you know, very nice people, very good people doing anything. So, so they, they stay on doing the other stuff actually. So, so that could give us a sense of whether, of whether it's, it's the task or the motivation of these people. Yeah, so, so in the insourcing, um, it's definitely the case that, you know, from a qualitative interview is that they're, they're mostly doing the marketing, but because they're there full time in the business, you know, they do some other tasks as, as well. And, you know, when the firm needs help on other things, they can do it because they become, you know, full employees. And so, you know, their main job description remains marketing, but, you know, they will do some of these other things. Whereas when you get those, the outsourcing professionals, you know, their, what tasks they're doing may change in terms of specific marketing things, but they're this, you know, they're coming in to do marketing. And in fact, the reason why firms said that they weren't keeping some of them on was that they had a whole list of things that they wanted done and they had all been completed. Um, and so they said, you know, we had, you know, whole range of these, you know, they've set up our systems for us, they've set up the websites, they've set up, you know, digital marketing things, and we can kind of take it from here. Um, and so, you know, there's some knowledge transfer potentially going on from these, these outsourced um, workers to, to the firm. And so those practices sort of stick even when the, the, they, they leave. But, um, you know, we don't have um, sort of more detail on tasks than that. So we don't know sort of you know, again, we, we see what practices are changing the firm, but we don't have at the worker level what, you know, what we, we tried to look at these tasks for the entrepreneur and, you know, the entrepreneur was changing the tasks, but we don't have for all the workers in the firm, you know, what tasks other workers are doing. Um, sir, I, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. 
So, um, so thank you very much, uh, David, for the presentation. So I just have a couple of questions that I just need the clarifications on. Now, the first thing is during the um, survey, did you measure subjective expectations or preferences, right, of these entrepreneurs regarding insourcing, outsourcing or training? And then do you, that's before the survey. And then did you try to measure it again after the survey to see what is the effect between pre and post the, the intervention? Then the second question regards, sorry, the second question regards um, the case of entitlements, right? So um, you said that this is being done by the government and uh, on ground, uh, one of the things that you experience a lot with um, these people is that they feel that it's coming from the government. So I don't lose anything by participating, right? So I get it, they come to my firm, they do things. And then six months down the line, they go back to square one, right? So they go back to what they were doing before. So the case of entitlement by the firms with your training, with the insourcing and outsourcing, does it change the mindset of the entrepreneur to do something better, to improve or to grow? Then um, the final question has to do with, during the presentation, I wasn't so sure whether you did like a, um, a difference between the female and the male owners of the business and what was the effect between the two groups in the same industry or across industries to see what and which of the two groups which of the two groups have more effect regarding insourcing outsourcing and training great no thanks these are all um interesting questions so on the first one and you know we would have we we debated about trying to give people the choice between insourcing outsourcing and you know we would have loved to have a group that could choose between these and in the end our sample size was was not enough and so because this insourcing and outsourcing were were new you know firms didn't know about it when they were applying for the program you know they got surprised by this news and we said you know you've been selected for this you know pilot where you're going to get this uh, the, the this other approach um, to tra to training um, so. You know, we never asked their preferences between them and we didn't let them choose on that. We, you know, we have been trying to do some more of recent work where we put them on a platform and we sort of see whether they're more interested in, you know, HR or marketing or, or accounting providers and, and sort of see if they were to get awarded a prize, you know, which one would they, they choose amongst those things. But we didn't have training as an option there. It was just sort of between those different things and you know again we're seeing that sort of preference for marketing i think and more for you know but um i can't i can't remember whether we're seeing it i think they don't they don't understand hr providers that much and so they're sort of mm -hmm. you know thinking directly let's just go for the marketing guy rather than somebody who will help me find marketing um so i think the hr is sort of a, a new thing for them to mm -hmm. just sort of think oh there's somebody who can help me this entitlement question, I think, is, is an important one. And I think that's sort of something, as you say, with, with training that they, you know, they show up because they think, oh, maybe I can get some money if I show up to this training. And they're not so interested in what the training itself is, is doing. Um, or, and they, you know, they, there's no, they can't control the quality of it. Whereas this is something that we thought was useful for the insourcing and outsourcing was while the government is giving them the money, all the rest of the transactions are taking place in the market. They are the ones who are hiring the HR firm. They're hiring the worker. They're hiring mm -hmm. the outsourced professional. Each month, they're having to take their money and pay, um, you know, for the service and decide whether they want to keep on on doing it. And, you know, while they're getting a subsidy, that subsidy is declining over time. And so that gets them, you know, more invested in it. And it becomes less of, you know, this is something that, you know, is, is being forced on me for the, from the government because I've got this whole choice in the market of who I want to have. And if there's a better guy out there, you know, maybe I want to replace them. And so we think, you know, that's another potential advantage of this market-based approach is, you know, this sense of, you know, the government's just giving me this stuff and I've got nothing to lose, but I, I you know, I'm not going to pay much attention once it's done, um, you know, becomes more different with this, uh, this other approach. And then finally, this question about, you know, whether this works better for males and females, as, as I noted, you know, the, the sample is reasonably balanced. We have 44% um, female, but unfortunately, because our sample size is a, a sort of, you know, smaller, than, if we'd had the 2000 firms, then we would have been able to s sort of start splitting more. But, you know, now by the time you get to 150 in one treatment group, and then you start splitting it in half, um, further, I, you know, we could potentially look at that for the business practices and see, 
Um, but for the business outcomes, we just definitely wouldn't have enough power, but we could sort of see whether it's, you know, potentially that's something we could look at at the business practice level where we have um, that. We, you know, we often get this question about, does it work better for some industries versus the others? And it's a sort of similar thing. We, we've mm -hmm. looked at manufacturing versus the other four industries and we don't sort of see much significant difference arise, but we are definitely underpowered for looking at these uh, um, differences, but we could look at gender on um, the business practices. Anyway. All right, just, uh, just one, final, one final point here. Now, um, interacting with some of these entrepreneurs on ground, one of the things that I noticed, at least some of us have noticed also, is the question of confidence, right? Confidence in solving business problems, self-image. And also, um, you also see that in terms of culture and beliefs, right? And, and you like, just take, for instance, you said that you did your study between Lagos and Abuja. So Abuja is more to them, cent not central, right? So when you are at that part of the country, your culture and your beliefs on how you see things change, right? They are doing things in a different way than you're doing in Lagos, so it's more commercially focused, right? So I was wondering whether maybe in this study or in the next study, what are you going to, you're going to do just to look into the culture, how, the impact of the culture, right? Also on the self image of the confidence of the entrepreneurs on using this, um, activities in sourcing, outsourcing, or training, because sometimes it also has an effect on the on the business. Yeah, and that's something I, get, I think where the selection into this program is already sort of selecting the more growth oriented, more confident type of people mm -hmm. who you know were, as I mentioned, almost everyone's got university education. Uh, almost half of them have got um, some you know post undergraduate education. There quite experienced they've been in business for a while they're um you, you know they're growth oriented they were able to apply online and then you know go through things and so um you know we're already selecting people who who have a bit more confidence and and um sort of initiative in their business in their business than you know the average business owner in these states um okay. there we again i um you know, we chose those two countries, to those those two states, because um, you know they were vibrant business markets. We were also debating about doing it in Kano um, and Kaduna as well, and it sort of seemed like there was sort of a lot of things there, and it would have been interesting to, you know, the the market for business provision seems seems like it would be interesting to compare across these places. But we have not uh, got there yet. But there certainly seemed lots of interest in the other, you know, in the consulting. The, we did do consulting in those other. The the project did training and consulting across the country and in, in mm -hmm. everywhere else. And so we have some other work where we're looking at the consulting and training um, in the the sort of whole rest of the country. And the consulting seems to be useful still, and, and in fact even better. Um, outside of these two big cities it's sort of helping you expand to to other cities and so that's sort of the advantage that you know the consulting is if you're in one of these cities in the north or outside of sort of lagos in the in the south it's helping you sort of think about how do i get more market share and expand to new markets and so um, but we didn't have you know trying to set up the whole market for insourcing and outsourcing in every every uh, state was was too much for us to try it first uh, so Right. Thank you. Ben, thanks for your questions. I, right. I, I know we're getting close on time, but uh, um, yeah, uh, Kadi, you're in charge here, so I'm happy to talk for a minute. If, if you more. don't mind, I think I think we'll listen to Peter's question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the, the relatively disappointing results as far as the effects of business training. Can you hear me? Sorry, you, you're fading in and out, so can you try again? It's about the, the effects of business training and the relatively disappointing results. So I was wondering uh, what may be driving that. And I think you mentioned that the degree of differentiation um, of the content was fairly low. I think it was fairly similar across uh, classrooms. And I was wondering about the level of the training. How, how, how high was it pitched? Uh, was it sort of very basic content or was it more advanced? And then a related question uh, was about the, the sort of the delivery format. Uh, so um, I was wondering if you also considered uh, something that could be a bit more demand-led, uh, a bit more um, focused on uh, differentiation in terms of the preferences or needs of these firms, training vouchers. 
Uh, would this be feasible in the context of uh, Nigeria, for instance? Yes, so these are, good, these are great questions and I should say, I definitely think training can be you know, made more effective. Um, this, these modules here and the provider, um, you know, they, they, they are designed for sort of smaller SMEs, but they're, you know, they're not the super basic um, content that's for, you know, a one person firm or things. And you can, you know, you can see, um, you know, here it was one day on financial management where, you know, using flexible budgets, analyzing variants, taking actions, you know, applying your budget in the enterprise, uh, you know, getting master budgets, consolidating information, things. It's, it's at sort of a you know, relatively high, high level. And the, the trainers, as we sort of mentioned, were very experienced trainers. And so um, it, I think it, it, you know, it is uh, disappointing that the training didn't deliver sort of anything. Uh, you know, we might have th thought these other things would be more successful, but the fact that the, tra the training didn't do as as much, and I think you know potentially this could also just be that these firms were already, you know, maybe still a, at at a level where um, you know for some of them it was they were already doing some of this already. But I think it's again just the motivation for firms going through this could also be that they, you know, they were really seeing this as a way of trying to get themselves eligible for grants and things and they didn't value the training so much, you know, in of itself. Um, this demand-led voucher approach to training, I think, um, you, you know, this may, be, I, I don't know that there's enough of a market for training providers compared to there is a market for these other things. And so, you know, these guys who provided this, are sort of, I mean, there's a, I'm sure there's a bunch of providers out there, but I think it would be harder to get firms to choose um, there and you know for us to know who who the quality is on on those providers without having done this experiment. I like you know we've seen that work for vocational training where you know there it's choosing you know the the type of course as well as the provider and the demand led ones seem to work better for business training, I think you know, that market is thinner than the vocational training side. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely an area where there could be more work, but, um, you know, or having, you know, this is something that we've been doing in other contexts is, you know, having firms put some skin in the game and pay for them. Part of the training themselves seems to get firms to exert more effort and may also, you know, cause providers to provide better service. But yeah, you know, I think, the key thing for us on this takeaway is not so much that this one particular training program was was sort of unsuccessful in this one context, um, but more, you know, here's an approach of using this market that hasn't been tried before and it seems promising and we should, you know, at least if we're going to be trying training elsewhere, we should think about can we use the market more instead and whether that using the market is these vouchers, like you say, or the, these providers we, we think is, you know, using that market maybe useful. Okay, so I think we'll wrap it up here. Thank you so much, David. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and for your questions. And we hope to have you back in Lisbon uh, very soon, David. Thank you so much. Yes, looking forward to it. Thank